Please turn in your Bibles to the Gospel according to Luke. <laughs> the Gospel according to Luke is where we are this morning, chapter 16. Luke chapter 16, where Jesus is addressing your favorite, my favorite topic of money. No, and not that church where the pastor is wearing a three-piece suit, sweaty brow, handkerchief, sow your seed, and God will bless you fivefold with a Rolls Royce. That's not us. Uh, we do do expository preaching. We study books of the Bible. We're in the Gospel according to Luke. Uh, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. When the topic of money comes up, guess what? We deal with it. We deal with it biblically, uh, contextually, and practically. And the use of wealth is a major topic in Luke 16. Last week we learned that wealth in and of itself is not inherently good or bad. It's what you do with it. It could be a blessing or it could be a curse. It could be used to grab power. Dominate someone, a tool of self-indulgence or a resource of, of blessing to love God and to love others. The danger, of course, is that our money can become an idol, used disorderly for only our own pleasures, our own enjoyment. Or it could be an excellent tool, a resource, as I said, used correctly, like demonstrating generosity, a way of showing love to our neighbor. The parable last week we looked at was the shrewd manager, shrewd manager, and it gets down to really the nitty gritty of uh, how his, Jesus' disciples ought to handle money. The shrewd manager last week taught us that there are things that we can learn from the world and use it for the gospel. The, the wise and shrewd manager's action, the wise and shrewd manager action, uh, his bold and decisive um, decision teaches us that we are to love others with our wealth to ensure their eternal future. So just as this manager we saw last week, the steward, recognizes that he was in a crisis. Remember, he was getting fired. And he moved shrewd, shrewdly uh, to hedge his security in this world. So disciples are to use their worldly possessions, although temporary, for the glory of God, for generosity, for the gospel, to store up treasures, we saw this earlier, for themselves. Pastor Chris wisely said last week, Jesus is telling us, is on the shrewd manager, telling us to invest our money in what has eternal value. Invest in what will produce eternal dividends. That includes the relationships you made by your generosity. Strangers become acquaintances. Acquaintances become friends. Friends become brothers and sisters in Christ. He says, the picture Jesus paints is that these friends you've made will be waiting for you in heaven to welcome you into your eternal home, end quote. That's what the shrewd manager we saw earlier in chapter 16, 1 through 13. And the question that we should walk away with last week, and I want to say it again, I think it's important, is that am I a good steward? Am I loving people with what God has blessed me with? Do we understand that inevitably Eventually, all our wealth will fail, chapter 16, verse 9. Chapter 16, verses 10 through 12 is, when we, is, is, is the fact that we need to realize that this life is an opportunity to love people, to love God, to serve God. That's what it means. He talks about being faithful in chapter 16, verses 10 through 12. Remembering, very important in the gospel, that we can't pay to receive salvation. It's not... It's nothing we give, it's something we receive. It's a gift of God through grace, through the person and work of Jesus, death, his burial, and his resurrection. We leave this world and there's nothing we're taking with us. And all that we have comes from God's grace as he has lavished it on us. That's what a good steward, a good steward recognizes that nothing I have is my own, everything is his, and I am to use what he has given me for his purposes, his glory. We don't worship wealth. Well, not to worship wealth. It's a wonderful instrument, but, not, but wealth is a horrible God. Jesus said, be a shrewd. Be someone who loves people. Be smart. Be shrewd. Makes eternal friendships. Someone who's generous, demonstrating grace. Don't put all your hope in your wealth. It'll fail you. In this life, it'll fail you in the life to come. You cannot, look at verse 13 of chapter 16. You cannot serve God and money. You can't do it. Why? Because it's a worship issue. And although in chapter 16, verse 1, Jesus is talking to his disciples, this parable, 
We saw last week. Look at verse 14. The audience changes now. The Pharisees who were lovers of money heard all these things and they ridiculed him. It seems that money was a problem. And I think, you could see, look at chapter 15, verse 1, that these are the same Pharisees who were ridiculed and who were scoffing at Jesus in chapter 15, verse 1. And now here Jesus is teaching on stewardship and they are rejecting him again. The same God who came to save them. The Pharisees, the grumbling ones in verse, chapter, verse, chapter 15, verse 1. They were grumbling, remember, because Jesus was, was preaching and teaching and, and sinners and tax collectors were drawing near to him. Chapter 15, verse 1, and, and they said, man, he eats with this guy. What kind of savior is he? What kind of prophet is he? What kind of man of God is he? He receives sinners and eats with them, verse 2 of chapter 15. And now the shift goes from grumbling, why is he doing that? Why is he fellowshipping with these sinners to accusations and disdain toward Jesus and what Jesus has to say about wealth. That's where we pick up our narratives. As we see, we'll see in these short few verses, three things. The ridicule and the rebuke, chapter, uh, chapter 16, verses 14 and 15. Uh, then we will see the law and the kingdom, and then the interpretation and authority. Now, these passages seem what, somewhat um, disjointed. But I, I hope when we get done today, you'll see there's a flow that Jesus is trying to teach us and teach them. So let's see what if Jesus turns from his disciples, and now he turns and he says, The Pharisees, who were lovers of money, heard all these things, and they, the Pharisees, ridiculed him, mocked him. Now, remember who the Pharisees are. Maybe, maybe you weren't here over the past couple of weeks. Pharisees came from a group that's called the separatist group. That's where they get the name from. They, they didn't hang out with sinners. They kept themselves away from those notorious people who sin, right? Their goal was to keep the nation faithful to God according to the law of God. They, they worship regularly. They pray regularly, regularly. But they set up this elaborate system of tradition to prevent the violation of the Mosaic law, but in doing so, they choked the people out. You could never keep all the traditions that they made, their, their man-made rules. But they were the moral ones. They were the righteous ones. They were the, the faithful ones. They were the ones who obeyed the letter of the law. They prided themselves in that. That's the Pharisees. And Jesus, not only... Not only we learn that about the Pharisees, but Jesus gives us something else in this text, some insight into their hearts. Look what it says. They were lovers of money. They were lovers of money. As I said, chapter 15, verse 1, Jesus told them and taught the Pharisees that God rejoices. Remember we saw that. God finds great joy in repentant sinners who come home. Chapter 15, verses 1 through 10. That that. There's two ways to try to save yourselves. We saw that in chapter 15, verse 11 through 32. The, the prodigal son and the elder son. The, the, the younger brother wanted the father's wealth, wanted the father's stuff. He didn't want the father. And, and how he got the stuff, he broke all the rules and took off. The older son wanted the father's wealth and the father's stuff. He didn't run away. He wanted nothing to do with his father, but he kept the rules. And Jesus pointed out to the Pharisees that you guys are keeping all the rules. You are following the, the letter of the law and these traditions as a way of trying to get into God's favor, into being accepted by God, but you're really outside the banquet. That's what we learned in that parable. Outside the feast. They were selfish. They were self-centered. They thought they could work their way into the grace of God. And then Jesus turns to his disciples in chapter 16, verse 1, and the legalists, these Pharisees, who, who thought they could earn their way, who thought that money was the way in, who loved money, heard what Jesus said about the gospel, heard what Jesus said about the use of money, and they ridiculed him. They turned their nose up to him. They, they, it was, the word is, is a, there was a strong contempt. You see, the Pharisees fully rejected Jesus' teaching and his authority, and they were challenging him all the time. They mocked him. They made fun of him. And unfortunately, we hear it today as well, the people who mock and ridicule Jesus today. 
Now, they may not come out and say it. Most people are not going to say, we're going to mock Jesus. We're going we're gonna to make fun of Jesus. Some do, but most won't say that. But let me tell you something, family. If you're a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ and you are, and your authority is the word of God, if your authority is the words of Jesus, the word of God, and in truth and in love, you stand upon his word and you say, well, this is my authority, this is what I believe, and you're mocked, at the end of the day, they're really mocking Jesus. Right? Remember when Paul was persecuting the church, he, he, he went after the church, he put people in prison, he actually put people to death. And then Jesus comes along and knocks Paul off the horse in Acts chapter 9. And Jesus says what? Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting the church? And he doesn't say that. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul, who became Paul, says, who are you, Lord? He said, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Again, when, when his followers, in truth and in love, stand upon the word of God that carries the authority of Jesus, and they mock it, they're really mocking, not you, but Christ. And that's something we can find comfort in. I think we need to find comfort in that. It's not about us. It's about him. So as Jesus is teaching about money, how we should not love money and use people, but use money to love people, that we should worship God with our money, but not worship money as our God, they mock him and they make fun of him and they, they don't want to hear it. And you know, really, at the bottom line, the reason why? Here's a shock for you. Religion can be highly profitable. Highly profitable business, right? Just like some people today will say, I'm doing it in the name of the Lord. But in their hearts, they really love money much more than they love God. That's why Jesus talks about having an eternal perspective of our earthly wealth. And that's why it was met not with repentance and obedience, but it was met with mocking. I mean, you could hear it. I, who, who is this poor, homeless, itinerant, itinerant preacher to tell us about money? Doesn't he know? Doesn't this man of God, doesn't this prophet know that our material prosperity was a sign of this great spiritual achievement and obedience? That's what they thought. That the true and the best way to please God, as a, a true and best way that God is pleased with what you do is your financial portfolio. Isn't that what this false, evil, prosperity gospel that's being taught here? In America and around the world, isn't that the same thing with the fine clothes, costly jewelry, expensive cars, and private jets? It's exactly it. Not to name names. Kenneth Copeland, T.J. Jakes, <laughs> Joe Osteen, Cephalo Dollar, Joyce Meyer. I mean, Copeland said that God's covenant has been established. Ken Copeland, God's covenant has been established and prosperity is a provision of this covenant. You need to realize that prosperity belongs to you now, end quote. Well, no one told Jesus because he was poor and they crucified him. So if your theology does not match Jesus, something's wrong with your theology. I'll tell you that right now, right? And Jesus would say to them, false prosperity gospel preachers, and to the Pharisees also who love money. Don't get me fired up. I, I, I can't stand the gospel, the prosperity gospel. Verse 15. You, lovers of money, prosperity teachers, are those who justify yourself before men, but God knows your heart. For what is exalted among men is an abomination in the sight of God. You, you would think after being pounded these, these Pharisees, after being rebuked over and over, it would shake them out of their self-righteousness, their love for money. Like, like sometimes, you know what, when you keep hearing the same thing or, or you keep seeing the same thing, something comes and finally hits you and jars you. Like the time when I was in a park, just wondering why Frisbees got bigger and bigger and closer and closer when it hit me. No, you'll get that later. The Pharisees' love of money was obviously related to a deeper problem. Look what it says. Their inclination to justify themselves rather than trusting God. Rather than trusting God and trusting Christ for their justification. Now, it's really important that we understand what it means here when Jesus talks about justifying yourself or justifying yourself before man. What does it mean to justify yourself before man? Well, you know what, family? It goes back, way back to Genesis 1 and 2. 
God created us in the Imago Dei, in the image and likeness of God. Adam and Eve were in the garden. We see in chapter 1 and chapter 2 of Eden. Uh, at the end of chapter 2, it says they were naked and unashamed. Why? Because they were absolutely at rest. They were absolutely satisfied with who they were, who they belonged to, and all of God's good and glorious provisions. But sin entered the world in chapter 3. And they and we turn and stop trusting God. We try to, to run and hide. We try to be our own Lord and saviors, which we are, listen, radically unfit to be. And the result of Adam and Eve's experience and what we experience is now this sense of inadequacy, a sense of something's not right, a sense of not being accepted. There's a deep spiritual disconnect, a, a spiritual nakedness. And, and what they did and what we try to do is we try to hide. We try to hide from God. Remember Adam and Eve, they immediately went and tried to cover themselves up with fig trees. That's self-justification. That's self-works-based righteousness. It goes back that far. Our sinful human impulse for self-justification goes all the way back to our first parents. This is what we are always trying to do. Conceal our sin by making ourselves look better than we truly are. It goes for me and it goes for you. And until I, until you recognize what the deep restlessness is, there's this separation from a holy God due to our sin, and what God has done for you in the gospel, you're always going to, I am always going to cover myself. You're going to cover yourself with something. That's self-justification. That's trying to be justified before man. You know there's something wrong. That's why we work so hard to cover it. Not until you see that can you understand the gospel. When you do, you run to God. We see in Genesis, and God clothes you. See, Adam and Eve clothe themselves. God comes along, kills an animal, and clothes Adam and Eve. That's gospel justification. It's an old movie. You've probably seen it. Chariots of Fire. Two Olympic runners, Harold Abram and Eric Little, both trying to win the gold medal in 1924 Olympics. And one of the interesting things in that story is that Harold Abrams was doing it, was running in the race in a need for a need to prove himself. The part of the movie where he actually, uh, uh, just seconds before the gun goes off to start the race, uh, um, Abram says, I have 10 seconds to justify my whole existence. I have 10 seconds to justify my whole existence. What he's saying is, I, 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 want, I want to know by being here that I'm justified, that my life counts. I want to know that I'm worthy, known, and accepted. I, and, and the way I need to convince myself, justify myself, is to run. But Eric Little, the believer, just wanted to please the God who has already accepted him in Christ. In fact, in one place in the movie, he turns to his sister and he says, God made me fast, and when I run, I feel his pleasure. You see the difference, family? Harold Abram was weary when he rested. Eric Little was rested when he exerted himself. Why? Because the Abraham's mode of operation was self-justification. Little's mode of operation was God-centered, Christ-centered, gospel-centered justification. Not our own. When we're outside the rest of Christ, when we are outside resting in the finished work of Jesus, all that he's accomplished on our behalf, we're doing stuff to try to prove ourselves, to convince themselves, God and others, that, that we're good. But self-justification never seems to be all it's cracked up to be, Right? Until we rest in the gospel. The Pharisees try to justify themselves by treating their financial prosperity, their law-abiding prosperity that, that showed itself in prosperity, as a validation of this spiritual success. Look at me. Their money was a sign, so they thought, of their godliness. But Jesus would say, no, no, no. You're trying to justify, justify yourself. Jesus is not going to buy what they're selling. God knows your heart. Look what it says, that last part of verse 15. God knows your heart, right? We see in 1 Samuel, remember, you remember Samuel the prophet, going to anoint David. God tells him, you know, he looked at all his sons, Jesse's sons, and right, there's nobody here. We got a little boy out back. 
God says to Samuel, don't, don't look at the outward appearance. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. You know the passage. And we say that sometimes, don't we? God knows my heart. Sometimes we say that it's just excusing our stupid behavior, our sin. Sometimes we're claiming, oh, it's pure. God knows my heart. The truth is, when Jesus talks about God knowing our heart, it, it says, yeah, he's showing us how foolish we are. His judgment is perfect. He, he sees our thoughts, our motives, our desires, and everything else under the surface of all our pretense. When it says God knows our heart, we should say, oh, yeah, he does, and that's frightening. That's the problem. Our hearts are the very knowledge, our, 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 excuse me, it's the very knowledge of our hearts that exposes our sins. Say, God knows my heart, and he still loves me. God knows my heart, and it's twisted with all kinds of false motives and, and bad thoughts. God knows my heart, but he still loves me. The problem is we need a new heart. Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is more deceitful than anything else and incurable. Who can stand it? And as the heart is exposed by God, look, at, look what he says. It's the great reversal. What is exalted among men is an abomination, detestable in the sight of God. What, what sinful people praise actually deserves divine damnation, is met with divine disgust. And now notice Jesus isn't talking about murder. He's not talking about terrorism, some really dark sin. He's talking about the love of money. He's talking about self-justification here, self-serving. A clear implication is that the Pharisees love money and they are idolaters. That's what, that's what the love of money, that's what worship disorder is. It, is. it is to run after, to love other things other than God himself. He's not the primary source and ultimate pleasure of our souls. It's called idolatry. Jesus was very clear with the Pharisees, and he, and he is with us as he looks at our hearts. Sometimes, I'll speak for me, but I think I can speak for everybody here, our outward appearance doesn't actually match what's going on. Don't shake your head like that. It's just Matthew 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but the inside are full of greed and self-indulgence. Like, like whitewashed tombs, outwardly appear beautiful, but within full of dead bones and all uncleanness. That's all of us outside of Christ. That's all of us trying to justify ourselves. That's all of us trying to hide, run, cling to something other than Christ. That's why we need a new heart, a regenerated heart. Self-justification, whether loving money or clinging to anything else, will lead to abomination. We have to embrace the gospel. We have to embrace Christ as our only justification. He alone justifies. He alone forgives. He alone lived that perfect, sinless life. And therefore, when we trust Christ, we embrace the gospel, we're in union with Christ, we rest not on our own accomplishments, but we rest on his accomplishment. That's the gospel. Rebuke, excuse me, ridicule and rebuke law and kingdom. Verse 16, Jesus turns, continues, I should say, and says, the law and the prophets were until John since then, the good news of the kingdom of God is preached. Now, we know from the gospel according to Luke in the first couple of chapters that John the Baptist, talk about John the Baptist, was, was miraculously born, not by, not by a virgin birth, but miraculously born, older parents, and raised up by God and was used to usher in the coming of the King of kings and Lord of lords. His name is Jesus. His purpose, as we read in Luke, is one crying in the wilderness to prepare the way of the Lord, the Bible tells us. The ministry of John pointed to a, the greater ministry of Christ. God would use John to not only prepare the way for the Lord, but as a bridge from the Old Testament promises to his fulfillment in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's John's role. Dr. Darrell Box said this, In a sense, a transition figure John has one foot in each era, old and new. But as the pointer of the way, he really belongs to the old era in terms of his function. He is its end, end quote. The final Old Testament prophet. So th this coming of Christ, law and the prophet, and the coming of Christ, is this major shift in human history. 
This does not mean that the Old Testament law was means by which a person was justified, that the law and the prophets in the Old Testament, that's how a man is justified. No. It's the same as the old and the new. We are justified, saved, and redeemed through faith alone, in God alone. Even Abraham, Genesis 15, 6, believed the Lord, trusted, believed, and trusted in the Lord, and it was counted to him as righteousness. He became just, justified. So John's message pointed to our wicked hearts. We know that from John, right? He, he preached to repent. He called everyone everywhere, even the Jewish people, to repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Matthew 2, 3. Good news. The kingdom of God is at hand. Remember, he pointed to Jesus and he said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, right? John says, yeah, here's the real king. Here is the Messiah. He's come to inaugurate his kingdom, but he's first going to die as an atonement for sins, a sacrifice for sin. Right after he John the Baptist baptized Jesus, says in Mark chapter 1, same thing. He came from Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and said the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe the gospel. You see what's going on here. The Pharisees didn't want to hear it. First they yawned, then they sneered, and then we see at the end of the gospel account, they're cheering, crucify him. But since John's coming, the good news of the kingdom is preached. From that day to this day, to me right now, to the ministry of the church. The kingdom of God is being preached. The new era has come. The law and the prophets is the era of promise now ceased to exist because it has been fulfilled in Christ. Again, Dr. Bach, he did a great commentary on this section. He says, the preaching of the kingdom's message is no longer a matter of declaring a distant promise but can be preached in terms of nearness and arrival. A new era has come with new realities and new authority, end quote. Good news. Good news because it meant that God's grace has come in the person of Christ. It's what the law and the prophets pointed to. It was good news because of the work of Jesus who would die on the cross for, for the abomination of our sins, rise from the dead with the power of eternal life. That's the good news. The law and the prophets functioned and pointed to the promise of the Messiah, the Christ who would come. Jesus is the good news of the kingdom because he's the king. And that by faith in the work and the atoning death of Jesus, his glorious resurrection, we're going to celebrate in a few weeks, the tomb is empty. We have forgiveness of sins. The, the perfect righteousness has been imputed to us by faith. And the promise of eternal life is given to all those who call upon him. That's the good news. The Pharisees, lovers of money, they, they misused the law. That kept them from the kingdom of God. For they treated their financial and moral performances as the way into heaven. As the way into salvation. They imagined that there is something they can do to justify themselves before man and before God. But the gospel is the good news. As sinners and tax collectors, lovers of money can come and be forgiven. We cannot save ourselves. We cannot save ourselves by fulfilling the law that we cannot keep, but simply by trusting in the grace that Jesus has shown to us in the gospel. A man will be justified by faith, said Calvin, when he lays hold of the righteousness of Christ and appears in the sight of God, not as a sinner, but as righteous, end quote. The kingdom is preached. The law and the prophets pointed to the king and the kingdom has come. Verse 16, and everyone forces his way into it. Now, that's an interesting verse. You guys could talk about it in your community group. It could be interpreted two ways. Uh, one is the middle voice. It could, be, it could be that we are violently rushing into the kingdom or we're violently against the kingdom. Or in, in uh, not the middle voice, but the passive voice, it, where it speaks about the kingdom of God being proclaimed and all are being pressed into it. In other words, passive voice means it's something that is done to you. Not something you do. I think that's the proper interpretation. That the energy and the power to, to, to come to the kingdom comes from God. It doesn't mean that we don't have responsibility. Still being pressed in, but it is God that's doing the work. It's his favor. It's his grace. It's his love. It's about something done to us by the gospel through the power of God. 
being pressed into the kingdom. That's what I think he's saying here. I think it's similar in chapter 14 uh, when, when he teaches this parable about the banquet, how God's love compels those to go out into the streets and to call people to come to the banquet. Is the love of God, is the grace of God, is the kindness of God. It is his insistence, it's his tireless determination of God to love and to care and to press and to pursue. That's what I think he's saying here. But we need to respond, not scoff at it. It's only through the gospel, the gift of repentance and faith, experienced by God's mercy and grace that our new hearts, our new affections for God prompts us, presses us to come into the kingdom. And notice what Jesus doesn't say. He doesn't say, now that the kingdom have come, now that the, 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 the prophets, the law points to the kingdom, the kingdom has come, now that grace has come, the law is now void. That's not what he says. Look what he says. Look at verse 17. It is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one dot of the law to become void. Notice that? What are you saying, Jesus? We well, said something similar in the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 5, do not think that I've come to abolish the law of the prophets. I've come not to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Now when Jesus talks about a dot or an iota, he's referring to the, the smallest, tiniest, littlest parts of the Hebrew letters. It's like saying, you know, did you, have, you, have you dotted your I's or crossed your T's? This family is Jesus' view of Scripture. Mark it. Not just every word, not just every letter, every I dotted, every T crossed was inspired by the Holy Spirit so that not one single word of Scripture will possibly fail or be void. Jesus himself accepted the Old Testament Scriptures as the final and enduring word of God as we do also the New Testament. The pattern of Jesus speaking here is promise and fulfillment, not rejection and refusal, right? It's promise and fulfillment. Now, just talking about the law, let me just spend a couple of minutes and say, when you talk about the law, we're talking about the Old Testament law of God, law of Moses and other laws of the scriptures, there have been many that would say there are, there are three types of laws. There are three uses of the law, and I just want to go through them quickly. It'll apply to what I'm saying in a moment. So there are three types and three uses of the law. As you look at the Old Testament, the three types of law is the ceremonial law, the moral law, and the civil law. And many of them fall into those three categories. When we say ceremonial law, we're talking about the Old Testament washings and festivals and sacrificial system of the Old Testament. The New Testament tells us that they were shadows of things to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ himself. In other words, if we were to keep the Old Testament ceremonial laws as an anticipation of the coming of Christ, as if he hasn't come, we are what? We are downgrading or we are at least uh, uh, denying the sufficiency of the work of Christ. We don't believe that the ceremonial laws are bound, bind, binding us today. The civil laws are given to the nation of Israel. There was a theocracy. God was their king, and he gave the laws, and they lived under, in that state, underneath God and his word. The church is not a state today. Yes, Jesus is king. Yes, we live in his kingdom. And yes, some of the laws we find in the Bible are ones that governments use, but we're not a state like Israel was. Okay? Then you have God's moral law. Family, let me tell you something about God's moral law. God's moral law is a reflection of who he is. God's moral law is for all creatures at all times, everywhere. Not just for Jewish people. It's not like you can murder somebody as long as you're not part of the nation of Israel in the Old Testament. It's a reflection of who he is. It's a reflection of his justice, his holiness, his honor, his faithfulness, his providence, his truthfulness, his love. The law given to us, the moral standard of God that reflects the character of the moral of the law giver is good. And it springs from the goodness of God's character. So God's moral standard is a reflection of, he said what, be ye holy as I am holy. It's who he is and who he created us to be. That's the moral standard of God. 
So you have three types. There's also three uses of the law. Again, Calvin does a great job. If, you, if you've got his institutes, you can read them. And he says the law was given to us for, just for that, to, to reveal the character of God. And what that does for us is God's character is revealed as we read the scripture, read the Sermon on the Mount. You should walk away going, I could never do that. If you read the Sermon on the Mount and say, yep, I got that, you read it wrong. Go back and read it again. So as we look at the law, it's like a mirror. That's what Calvin said. It's a mirror. It shows us our sin. It shows us his perfection and our imperfection. So we don't, we don't judge our behavior. We don't judge what we do and say by the cultural standards of the world. World, We do it by what? The scripture. As God revealed himself to us in scripture. And as we look in the mirror, as we see the law of God, as we see the perfection of God, we cry out with the psalmist, if, if you, Lord, would mark our iniquity, if you held it against us, who could stand? None of us. That's why Galatians says that the law was our guardian. It was a schoolmaster to bring us onto Christ so that we could be justified by faith. The law reveals our sin. It reveals the holiness of God. And we come to the place going, I can't do that. I need help. Save me. And we run to Jesus. For salvation, cleansing, redemption. That's the, that's, that's the work of the law of God. The second one is to restrain evil. God gave us the law because there are people that need to hear, don't speed, stop at the red light. Romans 13 says, for he, that is the minister of the lawgivers and the, the law, uh, the ones who carry out the law, he's God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. He's God's minister, an avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. God gives us the law, we, we adopt the law, and we are ones who hold people accountable to the law. The final use of the law of God is guidance, is our guidance, God's moral law. Not only God saves us from the penalty, but God reveals to us what we as children of God are how we ought to live our life. You see, we as Christians can please, go, please the Lord and do as he commands because Philippians tells us God is working in us. God is working in us both to will and to do for his good pleasure. The reality of, of pleasing the Lord, loving God, worshiping God, obeying God, because of the gospel, changes everything about the view of the law. It becomes a joy. It becomes a pleasure. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll obey my commands. You see, this is the highest function of the law. It's an instrument used to love and to worship and to please the Lord our God. The moral law no longer condemns us because Christ died in our place, but it is our it is the written moral standard of God that is our what? Pathway. I've said this before and I'll say it again. We're not under the law as if we need to win God's approval, as if we need to obey and be accepted, as if we need to just follow what he says and be forgiven. And somehow our moral performance will give us access to God. That's living under the law. I'm going to really work hard. I'm going to really do this. I'm going to go to church. I'm going to do all these things. And then God will love me. Then God will accept me. That's living under the law. We don't live under the law. We don't live above the law and I say, you know what, God, I'll tell you what's right. Don't tell me what's right and what's wrong. I'll do whatever I want to do. That's living over the law. No, the law becomes the guidelines. The moral standard of God gives to us the things that God would want and desires and, and commands us to do. The law of God is our guide as long as this, listen to this very carefully, the law of God, the moral standard of God is our guide as long as we know it can't save us. That our salvation is by grace alone through the perfect work of Jesus. I, I mentioned this before. I just love this quote. So if you heard it seven times, I'm sorry. Dr. Sinclair Ferguson in The Whole of Christ, W-H-O-L-E. Love is what law commands, and the commands are what law, love fulfills. Love is what law commands, and the commands are what love fulfills, because love requires direction and principles of operation. Love is motivation, but it's not self-interpreting action or direction. Commandments are the railroad tracks on which the life empowered by the love of God 
poured out into our hearts by the Spirit runs. Love empowers the engine. Law guides the direction, end quote. See what he's saying? We ought to love one another. Yes, the highest of all things, but what does that look like? What does that mean? Don't cover your neighbor. Don't lie. Don't cheat. Don't commit adultery. We'll see that in a minute. Love the Lord thy God before all other things. That, that, that's what love looks like. It's by God's power and God's strength that we're pressing into the kingdom. As we're pressing into the kingdom, because the kingdom is preached, I want to know what God loves. I want to know what God hates. Now, here's the point. If the Pharisees were really experts of the law, they would embrace Jesus and the kingdom message to which the king, the message of the law and the prophets pointed to. That's the point. Jesus is his fulfillment. He is the one who justifies and by his grace and power enables us to obey. You see, they were trying to justify themselves rather than stand upon the perfect work of Jesus who empowers us by grace. That's the point. And then Jesus goes on. Verse 18 to close. Everyone who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. And he who marries a woman divorced from her husband commits adultery. Now, Jesus is declaring, divorce is divorce, adultery is still adultery. In other words, we cannot set aside God's moral standard, his law for marriage, any more than we could just void any other law, any other moral standard which God has set in the scriptures. But here's the question, why this section? Why did God bring up marriage and divorce? Why didn't G Jesus say something like, you know, don't commit murder or don't steal or any other moral standard by which we are to follow? Why bring up marriage, divorce, and remarriage? Why? Good question. That's the question I went into it this week. Well, here's the deal. In that day, there was a debate, a highly fought-after debate on Deuteronomy 24.1, the law, and it says this. When a man takes a wife and marries her, if then she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some indecency in her and writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand, sends her off out of his house, and she departs from his house. Deuteronomy 24.1. On that passage, there were two prominent theologians, two prominent views of, of interpretation. And one of the main guys who was teaching, he actually died about 20 years before Christ's ministry, is a guy by the name of Hillel. Very famous, very well known, very popular, uh, and had, had a mark on Jewish culture. He interpreted that passage in Deuteronomy to mean that anything that displeased the husband was grounds for divorce. All right, And he, and he put great stress on those words, found no favor in his eyes, and found some indecency. And he said, you know what? Listen, if she burns the dinner, get rid of her. They didn't season your food properly, she's done. Speaks loudly, neighbors hear her. If she's argumentative, give her a certificate of divorce. Argumentative, ladies. I'm just saying. <laughs> Easy divorce in that day. Terminating marriage, simply by presenting a certificate, for it, a certificate of divorce, sending away. So these Pharisees who were so-called expert of the law, who were legalists, also became what is known as antinomians. Okay? They were legalists, they had tradition, they had all these rules and regulations, they're choking people out, put people in bondage to their stupid rules. That's what legalism does. But their legalism was so pervasive that they became antinomian. Antinomian means against the law. Because they would try hard to get out of the demands of some of God's laws. Laws they didn't like. Laws that they would find loopholes in. They were the ones interpreting it anyway. Nowhere was it more clear than the teaching on marriage and divorce in the traditions of the rabbis. Like... I read, you know, if she breaks their favorite dish. I mean, the, the stuff they had was just unbelievable. So the Pharisees undermined the sacred institution of marriage, and Jesus is calling them out on it. Now, there's a couple of things going on here I just want to point out really quickly. The first thing, Jesus is not, let me say it again, Jesus is not weighing in on the cultural debate of, of marriage. He's not saying, hey, I know there's a hot debate going on. Let me give my, my two cents on marriage and divorce. That's not what he's doing. He has all authority. 
He is speaking with all authority, all moral authority that resides in him and comes and flows through Christ. He's the king. He's God in the flesh. He's not like, hey, this is what I think. No, this is it. The word who became flesh and dwelt among us. Number two, when Jesus brings up this topic of marriage and divorce and remarriage, it's not exhaustive. Jesus sets forth the basic principles, but not every single scenario. We know that God's intention is that marriage is for one man and one woman in covenant together forever. But there are circumstances, I'm not going to get into it deeply, but there are circumstances in Scripture where divorce is biblically permissible. The adultery, Matthew 19, abandonment of an unbelieving spouse, 1 Corinthians. Some would say treachery in Matthew, uh, excuse me, Malachi 2. But we would all agree divorce is, is never God's defined will for any marriage. And the exceptions, it tells us in Matthew 19, were given to us for the hardness of the human heart, right? I don't have time to get into all that. We do have a sermon. If you're interested, you can come and see me. So I will say in the famous words of a great theologian, Forrest Gump, that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> Getting back to the text. The reason Jesus chose the example of marriage and divorce as the ongoing validity of the law of God was because this was the very law that the Pharisees were failing to keep. That's the point. One commentator, Norval uh, Gelden News, says this. These words are especially directed against those Pharisees who allowed divorce to the husband on various kinds of trifling matters, but violated the right of the wife in such a manner that no right of divorce was granted to her if she was unjustly or cruelly treated by her husband, end quote. Leon Morris says that the Pharisees were very permissible or permissive, allowing men divorce on the most trivial grounds. You see... Here's the deal, family. The Pharisees prided themselves as the great upholders of the law. And here Jesus is expounding on the law and applying it in the area in which the Pharisees were hypocrites. They were vulnerable. Remember, they had ridiculed him to try to justify themselves. And now Jesus says to, the, to hear about the law because the Pharisees were, were constantly accusing him of demeaning the law. And he's saying, no, you're the ones. No, you're the one. You, you don't have the right interpretation, the right authority. I do. The law has been proclaimed by the prophets up to John, but by your life and how you act and what you're doing, you're undermining the law. That's the point. And if the law, if they understood the law correctly, if they understood as Jesus, I mean, just pointed right to them, if they understood that, it would have changed their heart. See, I still think, even here in this rebuke, I still think Jesus is going after them for salvation. Like, guys, you're kidding. You don't keep the law. Stop trying to justify yourself. You fail miserably on this very clear, black and white teaching of Deuteronomy. And that's why you get this seemingly strange reference to adultery and divorce and remarriage. He's illustrating that their attitude toward money, their attitude about this bad teaching on divorce, is because they fall short of keeping the law. For them to do what? Run to Christ. You see what Jesus is doing? Showing them their utter failure, showing them their self-justification, their self-effort to keep the law so they can have Forgiveness through the Savior. So as important as we understand that the moral law is still the standard for behavior, it's more important for us to know the grace God has for us in the gospel. What's the good news of the kingdom of God? How do we press into it? It's not by keeping the law perfectly. Nobody ever does. And it's certainly not, as the Pharisees try to do, finding loopholes in the law to get into the kingdom. The good news, the way into the kingdom, is by God's gracious forgiveness of those who would repent. You see, the law can't forgive you. The law tells you you need forgiveness, but the law won't and cannot forgive. Only the gospel offers forgiveness. Only God can forgive you through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's through repentance and faith whereby we lay hold of that forgiveness, where we lay hold of the righteousness of Christ. We lay hold of his moral, perfect record on our behalf. 
So as the band comes up, I want you to think of this as we go to our song. I want you to think of this. Maybe you're here this morning and you need to hear that self-justification is an empty promise. Self-justification is an empty promise. Maybe you need to know that your self-help your, your self-efforts to justify oneself, to cover yourself, to hide yourself, keeps you from the gospel. The law reveals sin and how much we need the Christ and as our Savior. Do you know him today? Have you trusted Christ today? Do you see that we are foolish to try to justify ourselves but Christ offers forgiveness. Christ offers his perfect life on your behalf. Christ offers rest for you in the gospel. Will you trust him? We're going to sing. I think I have it here. There's a couple of verses on there that are particular. Thank you, my brother. Where sin is trade, their filthy rags for his righteousness supplied. Oh, grace. The mount of grace to thee we cling. The law has set us free. We're, we're free now to follow and obey Christ. And we're going we're gonna to sing this song together. And my prayer is that we respond. We're not just singing the words on a screen or, or the band up here. Let's, let's keep our mind fixed upon Christ. Trusting him, being justified in him. And receiving all that he has for us as he died for our sins and rose from the dead. Let's pray. Father, we, as we sing here, our sins are many, but your mercy is more. And Father, maybe there's someone here trying to justify themselves, trying to work at salvation, trying to work at being accepted by you. But Lord, you have in the cross, in the work of Jesus, loved and accepted. And Lord, it is out of gratitude and thanksgiving, out of our salvation, out of our redemption, that we want to hear what you have to say. Command us, Lord, we pray, and do as you have called us to do. But Lord, may we never get that backwards. This will never do it that way. It'll never happen. So, Father, we pray that you would press deeply the truths of the gospel, that we are loved, that we are forgiven, that we are accepted because of Christ. And it is then and only then will we follow you, walk with you, obey you. And, Lord, as we sing this song, let our hearts be just stirred in affection toward you and the grace you've given to us in Christ. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.